Well, hello everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be speaking with you today. My name is Alexander Hyde, as, as Lynn has said, and I am an intelligence analyst within the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau at the City of London Police. And uh, my force, the City Police, is the national uh, policing lead in England and Wales for both fraud and cybercrime. So I thought that it would be practicable before we get into um, some of the, the specific frauds we're going to look at today to discuss just how fraud reporting throughout England, Wales and, and Northern Ireland works. So you have that overview and knowledge of the fraud reporting landscape, really, and can understand a little bit about how I know what I know and where that data is coming from. So hopefully, if uh, Link can tell me, that's just changed slide. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Brilliant. OK, so if a member of the public wishes to report fraud, either against themselves or on behalf of another, they should be reaching out or being directed to an organisation called Action Fraud. Now, Action Fraud is the public facing inroad, if you like, to reporting fraud to the police. In addition to the reporting tool, Action Fraud also has pl plenty of explanatory guidance, prevention advice and details of, uh, you know, other organisations, welfare groups that can be of some support. Um, so it's a really uh, useful little um, resource for kind of fraud prevention. And also it has the, the, the necessary reporting tool on it. I should also say that if you do uh, report fraud locally, uh, i.e. to your local police station or, or via 101, um, the local police force will either signpost you to uh, action fraud in the first instance, um, or they would make a report on your behalf, having taken down what you what you tell them when you give your account, um, depending on which they decide is most suitable at the time. Now, the reason why we encourage fraud to be reported centrally in the country, as opposed to locally with individual forces in the first instance, is because of the nature of the crime that is fraud itself. It's unlike any other type of criminality, really, that, that we may be subjected to in our lifetime. And to illustrate this, if you imagine uh, a burglary, there is a physical crime scene, i.e., you know, the, the premises that's been burgled. And that crime scene will be in an area where a single uh, territorial police force will have uh, a geographic responsibility to police and investigate crime within. Now, in order for that burglary to occur, there needed to be a physical presence of a suspect to break in, take property and ultimately make off from that location. What remains after the burglary, the evidence, the clues, they will all be in one place or close by. And it's likely that the suspect is also geographically close or has a geographic footprint within the crime scene itself. With fraud, however, things are a bit different. If we were to fall victim, for example, um, purchasing a non-existent product from a bogus online web shop, there can be several victims of the same fraudster or group of fraudster if they're an organised gang at the same time. And these victims could be located right across uh, right across the country from, you know, Cumbria to, to Cornwall or London. And if we really, if we did the same thing that we did with burglary, we could have five victims of the same fraudster living in five separate police force areas. Um, and that would mean five separate investigations into the same suspect for the same offending. So that's five separate forces trying to retrieve the evidence. Um, and really that from a, a resourcing, from an effectiveness, from an intelligence perspective, that doesn't really make much sense. But by bringing all of those reports together, we're able to see the full picture of what that fraudster is doing, the harm they're causing. We can group those reports into a case. And then based on the work that we do, we can decide which authority is most appropriate to actually carry out the full investigation concerning the offending going forward. So how can you report to action fraud? There's a little bit of information on here. Um, well, we have our National Fraud and Cybercrime Reporting Centre who can be called and you can speak directly to an agent um, and they will ask you your questions to determine what happened and allow you to give your account of, of the events. Um, and you can also self-report online via a reporting tool on the website. We also offer uh, a 24-7 fraud reporting service for business, uh, charities and indeed other organisations who may be subject to a live cyber attack uh, against any IT infrastructure that they have. 
Now, I should at this point very quickly, if you see at the bottom, mention that Police Scotland are, are a little bit different. Um, they aren't part of action fraud, um, but we do work closely with our friends and colleagues north of the border. Um, so if you are here today from uh, per perhaps a university or a higher educational institution from Scotland, um, please report uh, via uh, 101. Um, and if there are any Scotland based uh, attendees uh, here today, rest assured that the rest of the presentation will still be very useful because the, the types of fraud that we are going to discuss, uh, you know, they happen across the UK and in many cases internationally as well. Uh, so it will still be relevant. OK, a very quick word on the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau, which is where I work. Um, we are a separate entity from Action Fraud, and it's our job to essentially piece together all of these reports that come in and cross analyze them with other sensitive and non-sensitive data to essentially create packages, uh, groups of reports that we call disseminations. Um, and they really concern the same offending with an overview of what additional work that we have done as a policing unit um, to uncover evidence so that packages really are as ripe for investigation as possible. We then have the, the uh, delegated authority to, to pass these um, to the most, appro uh, most appropriate law enforcement agency, uh, either in the UK or, or beyond where we can. We're also responsible for identifying upcoming threats, trends, um, vulnerabilities across the fraud landscape um, and keeping both law enforcement generally, uh, as well as the public, such as yourselves, uh, informed about what you need to be looking out for. So I hope that's explained uh, just a little bit about how fraud is reported uh, and how we as law, law enforcement and as a country really approach, approach it as a crime type. So uh, I will move on to the specific types of fraud that are of relevance today to students. And I thought we would um, kick off really with investment fraud. Um, and investment fraud um, happens actually to be the area of fraud which I focus on in particular in my day to day work. Now, it might be a surprising fraud type for many of you to see on a presentation which looks to provide an overview of those frauds typically attracting students. And I think there is perhaps a, a bit of a public perception that the, the typical or expected victim demographic for investment fraud would perhaps be older people who are at risk of losing uh, more substantial sums rather than uh, perhaps younger people. And what I would say to you uh, about that thought is, yes, historically and traditionally, and I have to be very careful when I use those words as an analyst, the victim demographic for investment fraud has been relatively stable. And it would be the case that um, you know, they typically be around 50, uh, 50 plus years of age. And the average loss would be measured in um, either the, the high single thousands or, or indeed uh, very far into the tens of thousands of pounds per victim. However, in the last few years, certainly, there has been a shift in the demographic of who is affected by investment fraud. And we are now seeing much younger victims, certainly of, of what I would say typical university age um, within reporting. And whilst the funds that they are losing are substantially less than perhaps what you traditionally expect from an investment fraud, because these victims are less financially secure and stable, the loss to this group is, is really proportionately just as impactive. So why is there this emerging trend with younger people and investment fraud? Why is there a shift and what is happening? Well, rather than pushing some of the more traditional commodities, the things that we're talking about here are stocks, shares, wine, energy and land. These were some of the, 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 the typical types of investment commodities that, that were seen. Um, and instead of advertising those opportunities through bogus companies, which can be very time consuming for fraudsters, they're instead taking to online social media platforms. And these can include, as I'm sure you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Telegram, amongst others. And what they're doing is they're advertising these criminal schemes, which require comparatively less technical skills to set up and appear convincing. Victims are drawn into these schemes because fraudsters often post pictures that display examples of wealth. So bundles of money, expensive cars and watches, etc. And what they'll do is on that picture, they'll post a link or they'll invite users to to contact the, the username of that page. 
Some of these schemes can include bogus services such as money flipping, um, and that's what they will offer through to the victim if they do get in touch. And that's essentially where they say uh, if a small amount is deposited, um, it can be perhaps doubled, tripled or, or quadrupled within an hour or 24 hours or, or two days. Now, one of the most prominent investment commodities out there with fraudsters uh, at the moment to uh, younger people is cryptocurrency. Um, you've no doubt heard of Bitcoin or perhaps some of the other cryptocurrencies in the news, um, certainly over the last few years, um, again, in, so in some cases in, in, in the recent weeks. Um, it's very often used cryptocurrency to target younger victims um, with the promise of quick returns because of the volatility, really, of the legitimate cryptocurrency market. The victims are convinced that there is an opportunity to actually make some money from this uh, and they will transfer funds only to be told that you know they've made a profit um, which in some cases sadly convinces them to invest even more um, unfortunately they are just numbers on a screen um, and they uh, they don't really exist when they do try to withdraw their funds or they ask for their their money to be returned by the by the fraudster the suspects are simply severing all contact and they don't receive anything back. It is true that promised returns in respect of younger people in investments are less than what they may have been uh, in investment frauds um, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But the, the really important thing and, and why I'm mentioning investment fraud as an emerging trend is um, the, the stakes really that, that fraudsters are asking victims to risk. It has opened up this younger, more financially vulnerable public group. Uh, and this especially includes students who might be looking to make, you know, a little bit more money quickly. Um, and they may be in a, a more financial hardship from different things going on in their life. So, so they are certainly at risk. Just to, to illustrate um, exactly how, how this trend is moving, uh, I published a, a recent report which focused on the role of social media as an enabler to investment fraud. So essentially looking at how social media can impact uh, upon investment frauds. Um, and we found that the most common victim age bracket from the study was those aged 19 to 25. That's the age group that the majority of our victims were at the time of making a report. And this accounted for a quarter of all the victims in the study. Um, victims were in the study who were 30 or under accounted for just under half of the victims. Um, so I would absolutely stress that investment fraud is a very real and current threat to, to younger people, especially those uh, in need of funds who may not be in a position to work, to earn. And that could be uh, to a whole host of reasons. Um, of course, for the, for the purposes of today, I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of, of studies and, and further education commitments, which means they don't have time for that job and they do get attracted into a very quick uh, way to make money, unfortunately. So that was investment fraud. And the next fraud type that I want to cover, excuse me, I have to keep the orange squash next to me. The next fraud uh, type that I want to cover is quite a broad fraud type, and that is advanced fee fraud. Now, advanced fee fraud is essentially what it says on the tin, as it were. Suspects either approach or they're approached by victims after uh, offering or advertising a product, a service, or an opportunity. However, before the victim can take advantage of or, or engage the service, the fraudster suggests that uh, an, upfront free, uh, an upfront fee is required first. Um, now for students, there are a number, a number of ways in which advanced fee fraud is tailored to exploit them. Um, and we'll discuss a second one in a moment, but perhaps um, one of the most important uh, relates to jobs and internships. And how this works is that fraudsters will advertise a, a role uh, online. It will usually be an attractive sounding entry level uh, or perhaps an internship role, which would be highly desirable uh, to a student. These bogus jobs and internships can be advertised in a range of places, and that includes social media uh, and legitimate job advertising websites. When the student inquires about the role, they're immediately asked for a CV or cover letter, cover letter which the agent, i.e. the fraudster, will pass on to the employer offering the role. 
perhaps unsurprisingly, a short while later, the fraudster will be back in touch with the victim to tell them, congratulations, you've been successful for the role, or that they've been invited to uh, an interview, which they will, of course, want to accept. And it is at this point that the fraudster will ask for that money. And some of the excuses why payment will be required can include commission for finding them the role, uh, perhaps servicing administration fees and vetting or referencing fees. If the victim isn't forthcoming with this money, they will be put under pressure to pay quickly or risk losing the opportunity to another candidate. So obviously that will really turn the heat upon them. Eventually, uh, if, if convinced enough, the victim will transfer the funds, which is usually a few hundred pounds, uh, and they'll be provided with a date and time letter confirmation from the fraudster uh, for their interview or their start date. Sadly, it's not unknown that many students in the past have turned up uh, to uh, the legitimate company buildings only to find out at the front desk that no such role has ever existed. Um, and then obviously once they do try to get back in touch with the agent or contact is severed. Uh, another potential and alarming part of the, the fraud MO is that suspects may ask for copies of identification such as a passport, a council tax bill or, or, or in the case of students an exemption form before being able to process their application and they say this is to ensure that they have the right to work in the UK and of course the reality is that this uh, information these details can then be used for other nefarious purposes and uh, we have issues with um, you know additional frauds being committed in the name uh, loans taken out and other services uh, taken out in in the student's name as a result so how do we protect against the job offer advance fee fraud. Uh, exercise caution when asked to pay in advance for an internship or opportunity. Speak to your university who might be able to verify its validity. I would never say uh, send fees for a, a, a job um, or role. Sorry, I would I would say never send fees for a job or role. Um, but I am aware that there are some courses where sometimes we do have uh, audition fees and other costs. Um, so it isn't unheard of that they may be asked for um, for a fee. Um, but if asked for a fee, it's, it's quite unlikely. Um, if they are involved, I would imagine that the university employability teams uh, should have knowledge of whether to expect this. Um, so the advice that, that certainly I would say is it's always best to, in, to inquire with the employability office first before searching out uh, those opportunities. So, you know, if a fee is asked for um, before you attend, um, that, that it's likely to be legitimate. Ask agents uh, which agency they work for and independently research them yourself. Don't just take their word for it. Find out independently if a person is working for a recruitment agency contact that agency to double check that the person does work for them and that that opportunity is indeed valid. Uh, the, second one, uh, the third one, sorry, contact the company directly, essentially. If you're approached by someone offering a legitimate opportunity on behalf of another employer, it's highly likely that that same opportunity is also advertised on a company careers website. And if it isn't, there's never any harm in calling their switchboard to check. Lastly, um, and this is perhaps the most important piece of advice, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, if a banking firm is offering a paid internship, for example, with 5,000 more pounds uh, a year than competitors, there's free travel, there's other perks way over and above uh, the other competitors, and the agent or employer is really responsive once you contact them, and um, you know they almost offer you the role out of hand, it's really time to, to stop and think. Contextualize that offer within the rest of the job market. Could it be true? Is it true? Or is it too good to be true? Okay, uh, next um, advanced fee fraud example I would like to cover briefly is rental fraud. Um, uh, rental fraud is of particular relevance, I think, to the higher education sector because the, the process of attending university uh, or other institutions to study is, is very often necessitates a move to a, a new area or region. And for many, this will be the first time in their lives in which they've, they've had to do this independent of others. Um, just to give you an overview of, of what we're looking at for, for rental fraud in the 2019 to 20 financial year, we had 8,000 reports 
um, from members of the public, and that was a recorded 24.5 million loss uh, to two victims. So it is very, very prevalent indeed. Rent fraud can be described as, as where prospective tenants are tricked into paying advance fees uh, or rent for the rental of premises, which they either don't exist, they're not for rent, um, they're already rented, or they're rented to multiple victims at the same time. And the consequence is that the accommodation is not available to victim and they lose those advance fees paid. To demonstrate that this is a particular threat to students, it's not uncommon for me to see increased increases in the reporting of rental fraud um, during September and October each year. And very sadly, this is because certainly through my experience of some of the reports I've, I've been working on, um, students have given a deposit or advanced rent, uh, including other fees uh, that the fraudsters have added on, only to travel all the way to what uh, they thought was going to be their home for the term or year. And they found out when they arrive, they've knocked on the door, and uh, the flat was never in the market on the first place and the person in the dwelling has no idea who they are. Obviously, this also renders um, students uh, at risk of homelessness, which, which obviously presents huge challenges for them going forward. There's several pieces of advice that we do give to students and others to try to protect them from falling victim to rental fraud. And I'll just elaborate on these a little bit. Um, number one, don't send money to anyone advertising rental properties online until you are certain that the advertiser is genuine. If you are sure, are not sure, do not send. I know this presents a difficulty because how do you know for certain that a property exists? I would always say it is best to pursue advertise, uh, properties advertised with an agency, but I appreciate that's not always possible. Um, but the good thing about agencies are you can call them up uh, and you can follow up with them over the telephone. You can check that the agency is registered in the UK um, and in some cases it, it is simple as checking that the address that they're providing you to their office actually matches on software as simple as Street View. We have had cases where the agency address uh, that a victim has been given, um, we've taken a look at it and it's come back to either an industrial estate or a field or a residential property and it doesn't look like a business at all. Um, and that's a really simple, quick, extra little verification tool to utilize. If you do take a look at their, what they're saying is one of their branches or offices and it doesn't look legitimate, then that's obviously a warning sign for you to exercise some caution. If you need to secure accommodation in the UK from overseas, seek help of the employer uh, or university that you're coming to or get a friend, contact or relative to check the property exists and is available. We know that many universities, certainly mine did, they have um, really good accommodation departments. Um, they can advise on suitable private lets. Um, I think there are some that have local landlord accreditation schemes as well, um, which are really useful. So we would always encourage um, students, especially international students to engage with those. And I do know obviously that that information is sent out to them. So it's really just hammering home that that support is there that if they need to find somewhere to live. Do not pay any money until you or a reliable contact has visited the property or agent with the landlord. Even if you have visited the property, be aware that fraudsters will rent apartments for the week from holiday home websites. So they will line up multiple viewings of a holiday home that they have rented out themselves in a false name. Essentially, they're showing you around a holiday apartment and passing it off as their own. So I would advise that if you do get shown around somewhere and there are any other existing concerns, search the address of the property you've been shown on open source, check holiday rental websites, just make sure that that apartment isn't up for short term rental anywhere. If there are any images in the advert online, you can always undertake a reverse image search to make sure that they haven't been stolen from a, another website because there have been occasions where we have had reverse image searches um, undertaken and the property straightaway popped up as a, a holiday home in another city uh, from the one that the, the, the victim wants to, 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 to stay in. So that's a really good quick piece of advice. Just make sure that it's not a holiday home by undertaking some, some of those basic checks. Ask for copies of tenancy agreements and safety certificates such as gas, electricity, HMO license that stands to reason it's good practice. Um, don't be pressured into transferring large sums of money, transfer funds to a bank account, having obtained the details by contacting the landlord or agent directly after the above steps have been followed. 
be skeptical if you're asked to transfer any money via a money transfer service such as Western Union. It's very clear now exactly what fees can and cannot be asked for when renting a property in the UK. Uh, there were some recent changes. There are resources out there, both within university accommodation departments, student unions, charities indeed, such as Shelter and Citizens Advice about what you can and can't be charged. So again, it's pushing people to to some of these to these um, these uh, support areas and, and some of these organisations. The moment anyone is asking for additional fees for other reasons, once someone has put a deposit down, this is when the alarm bells should start to be ringing and the caution should start to come out and the break should go on. Students are really vulnerable to this type of fraud because they're very new to the world of renting. There's added pressure because of the need uh, to be in a certain location for their studies. And they've also got the, the added worry, I mean, certainly I, I did, of competition from other students who will also be on the hunt for accommodation. So sadly, um, with, with rental fraud, it's the, it's the perfect storm almost for, for students and, 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 and fraudsters really do take advantage of it. So it is, a, it is a certainly a big one to, to watch out for. OK, the, the, next, um, the next area that I'd very quickly like to discuss is ishing. Um, ishing may not be a term that you're wholly familiar with. However, phishing is very more uh, likely to be something that you have heard of. When we say ishing, we're taking into account really the proliferation over the last 10 to 15 years or so of the, the other ways that fraudsters are sending malicious content over to victims. So as you can say, uh, phishing actually relates to the sending of fraudulent emails to unsuspecting victims either containing malicious links, attachments, or trying to convince you to disclose personal details. Um, that tends to be a catch-all for, for the other two, um, but they can be used independently. We have smishing, um, think of SMS smishing, uh, where the communication method is via a text message. And finally, we have vishing, which is where an individual might make a voice telephone call um, and try, you know, or leave a message um, and they have the same criminal aims really as phishing or smishing. They're just using a different comms method. Students, again, are targeted in issuing fraud specifically. Uh, quite recently, Action Fraud has issued an alert affecting students where suspects are claiming to be HMRC. They're sending texts uh, and saying that they're due a tax refund. Um, they're asked to supply their bank details. Um, and then obviously there's, there's, there's compromised personal details that, that have been disclosed. In two months alone, these aren't our figures, HMRC, they have had 5,000 reports. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to find out how many we had had, um, but in the press release, 5,000 reports uh, with it into HMRC alone. So you can see uh, how absolutely huge um, this the scales are when it comes to issuings. Um, and be aware, obviously, not everyone will report fraud, uh, either because they're, they're unaware or that they, they, they don't they don't want to tell us about it for, for whatever reason. So that is probably far greater than that figure. It's difficult to spot um, and it can be challenging to counter. So the advice that we put out is essentially very strict. Um, if you receive an unsolicited, unsuspect, unexpected email, text or call, don't click links. Don't reply to the same number or contact um, in the same contact thread if it's a text, for example. Don't supply any information on links that you followed. Don't open or download attachments. If you are expecting a communication, respond to any approaches, having independently researched those contact details online. And if you're called and you're unsure and you feel like uh, it might be a bit of pressure, just tell the caller you'll contact them yourself. I've done it multiple times. They will not have a problem with that whatsoever. As I say, it is very difficult to avoid phishing at the best of times, but there are some practical ways to avoid it. Um, one of which I think would be really handy for, for students. And that is for, to ver for very early on um, when they join, I would say the creation of a new email address is a, a really good way of um, preventing this. And, and the reason I say that is um, when I certainly think back to my time um, at, at university, those those first few weeks, I remember that everywhere I went, be it a, a pub, a restaurant, shops, uh, anywhere, 
they were all asking for my email address or some other contact details with the incentive of either a discount, a free item, discounted tickets. Uh, and I was, you know, I was supplying them with the same email address that I used for my student loan, my banking, um, uh, university, um, et cetera. And that frankly made my inbox a mess and of course presents a risk to my details. Now, when I say that, I'm in no way saying that, that these legitimate businesses are involved in fraud. However, the more places that my details are taken down and stored in these company databases, the more chance there is that they will be stolen if one of these companies is subject to either a hacking or, or a cyber attack. If my details are leaked, this data is then sold on by hackers on the dark web as uh, credible addresses for fraudsters to target. Um, so for this reason, I would encourage all new uh, or existing students to really what I call fragment or, or segment your email accounts. As soon as you start university or in a new area, get yourself an email address that's separate from professional and personal life for things such as your sign ups, your guest lists, offers, newsletters, discounts, etc. And keep that away from any email addresses that you're using for your student loan, your banking, your close family, friends, etc. And it also stands to reason, and I'm sure this is advice you already give out, please do not use the university, uh, the .ac.uk email account um, for signups and things like that. It's much better for them to keep, uh, you know, their, their academic related work separate. And by doing this, they'll be able to put that degree of separation between the details that matter and those that they can live without if something goes wrong. And then if an email address is compromised, they can shut it down and start again to avoid that unwanted contact. OK, and the very last topic um, that I would like to cover very quickly is money mules. So what are money mules? Well, essentially, money mules enable money laundering. Um, and money laundering is, is the washing, really, of the proceeds of crime through a seemingly innocent bank account so that funds appear legitimate before they're being sent on. Usually it works by a money mule uh, agreeing to share their bank details so that cash can be deposited into their account with a view to uh, them sending that on to another bank account. Fraudsters often target people who don't have a history of criminal activity and have good, clean or non-existent credit history, such as students. This is in the hope that it makes these transactions that the fraudsters convincing the, the, the student to do seem less suspicious to banks. Um, and really, as they're going through the system, they're hoping that that prevents them from being flagged as suspicious. Money mules can be entirely innocent parties, hence the term mules. They're essentially being led into believing the, the funds are part of a legitimate business or, or a job that they've signed up for. The problem is you won't know where the money is coming from or where it's going, but it could be used to fund drugs, uh, child trafficking, uh, in some cases, even terrorism. Um, and there are, however, times when money mules are aware that they're facilitating the movement and concealment of criminal proceeds. Um, and as a result, really, with money mules, anyone found to be involved in money muling, i.e. money laundering, um, they risk finding themselves the subject of a criminal investigation, possibly even prosecution. So it can be very serious. It's absolutely vital students keep control of their own bank account and do not send funds to people or places they don't know upon request of another. It's also just as important that they don't agree to receive funds from people that they do not know. We know students are targeted with their clean record, good credit history or, or, or lack of credit history and the lack of suspicion, but how are they targeted? And the way that they will do this is to circle back a little bit to, <clears throat> to advanced fee fraud is that jobs will be posted online on sometimes legitimate job websites, uh, and indeed on social media, um, maybe local pages. Adverts are usually quite vague. Um, the types of things that they will offer is work from home opportunities, easy money opportunities. They tend to be the buzzwords that will be used. Um, and a very quick example to take you through with this is the mystery shopper job. So the mystery shopper advert, which is quite popular, 
Um, what the suspects will do is they will purport to work for a company contracted to test a bank's customer service skills. And as part of that, they'll ask to send money to your bank account. Once you receive it, you're told to immediately send this money on to another bank account. The mule is paid via a commission, um, and that's usually done by the fraudster telling the mule to deduct a, a nominal amount from the balance that has been transferred to them before they then send it on to details that the, that the fraudster will supply. Now, they will claim that this process is to test the banking transfer times and that the, uh, the, the, the person that's undertaken, that's receiving the funds into their account is that mystery shopper. They need an existing customer so that they don't know that they're working on behalf of the firm uh, that's, that's checking their customer service. In reality, of course, what they are doing is washing the proceeds of crime through a bank account. In some circumstances, uh, or in other circumstances, should I say, uh, an, another variation is um, they may um, ask the mule to take out several mobile phone contracts, having provided them with the funds to do so. Um, so once this has been done, you know, they could take out maybe four or five phones in, in, in a day on, as a contract. Um, they will arrange collection of those mobile phones from the mule. Um, which in reality they will either sell on to obtain, obtain clean funds or they will be used in, in other criminal activity. But the mule, however, um, is now in an even worse state because they now have several phone contracts in their name, which they're actually still liable to pay for. Secondary consequences can, of course, uh, include a severely damaged credit history, a uh, frozen bank account, uh, and that can make it really difficult to move forward, make payments, and affect their eligibility for credit in later life. And you can see some, some key messaging on the side. I do want to give time for questions, so um, I won't talk through those. Um, and um, this is a, just a, the last slide. That, that was everything that I thought I could fit in. I realized maybe I could have done a little bit more. Um, but I apologize if it was a bit of a whistle stop tour. There's a couple of further thoughts um, that relate really specifically to, to students before we close that, that I'd like um, people to consider. Um, and this is, you know, the first one is partly due to COVID, uh, coupled with some of the advances we've seen in technology. An increasing number of students are learning at a distance, and that does mean uh, less interaction or reduced interaction with, with staff and peers. Uh, and these are the people that, that could be spotting signs of, of, of fraud, really, before a victim does. Isolation uh, over the last two years we have seen in, in law enforcement has really managed to work to the advantage of fraudsters in helping them part victims from their money. Where you can, please always uh, try to make advice, support services and awareness campaigns visible for those who are both on and off campus. Overseas students can be extra vulnerable to certain frauds. There'll be some frauds which home students will be able to spot. And um, those from overseas, because of their lack of maybe the understanding of processes in the UK, um, that they, they wouldn't be able to spot them. So perhaps some extra support will be needed and made available to these groups. I know it's already given, um, but we also need to be thinking about fraud as well in respect of that additional support. Um, fraudsters looking to target students they will know what is commonly known as the loan drop dates, roughly. They'll know the academic year starts and ends. So it is likely that any criminal activity will increase at these times. They want to be targeting people who have got a top top and full bank account. If you're planning any awareness or publicity for your students, um, I would definitely say bear these dates in mind when you're diarising any campaigns or, or awareness that you might want to do make sure that this information is fresh in students' minds at the right time. Uh, as a last reminder to you all, uh, there is help, advice and the ability to report fraud at www.actionfraud.police.uk and we also offer an alert service as well. Um, so please consider signing up to that and you will receive a notification or your nominated organisation's uh, email will receive a notification if there is a, a particular alert of relevance to, to uh, a threat that we've identified. Uh, I'd also very quickly like to, to plug Cyber Aware, Take 5 uh, and the National Cyber Security Centre. They're really good resources to promote and keep an eye on for the latest trends and threats. 
Um, I think it's everything. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I know I've talked a lot. Um, I look forward to any questions because I haven't seen the chat bar, um, but I am very happy to stay a little bit later if need be and finish them if there is anything. So thank you. Excuse me. That's um, brilliant, Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've made I've made loads of notes. I don't know if others have as well. Um, have has anyone got any questions? Um, so, sorry, I'm just looking in the chat. Uh, Miriam said um, the sound cut off just momentarily, Alex. Where you said you could sign up for alerts. Um, and sorry, Lynn, it's a, it's a little bit um, grainy. So can you, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, okay, it was so just a little bit grainy. So um, somebody's asked about um, where we can sign up to get alerts. You know, you said we, we, we can sign up and we'll get alerts about uh, any particular scams or anything that's going on. Yeah, so there is uh, a section on the Action Fraud website. Um, I believe it may be in the newsroom. Let me just see if I can quickly pull it up on my work one now. But you can submit um, an email address or indeed your um, organization's email address. If you go on, so if you go to the Action Fraud website and there's a prevention tab. Okay. And on the prevention tab, there is sign up for Action Fraud Alerts. That's brilliant. Um, and it will take you through the steps there. That's brilliant. And uh, before I go back to see what other questions are in the chat, are there any materials that are particularly student friendly, or not necessarily student friendly, young person friendly? Um, do, do you know where we'd be able to get anything that we might be able to use on our campuses? I don't mean printed materials, you know, any social media examples or anything that we could use? Yeah, I mean, action fraud themselves is on social media. Um, so I would certainly recommend that you you look to follow uh, all of our channels. Again, that's that's out there on on the website for you to follow. Um, in terms of specific student friendly um, material, this is something that I'm really interested in, in in looking to develop. Certainly, as we see younger victims as an investment fraud, um, I guess subject matter expert, you could call me. Um, because we've had that shift, um, it's never really something I've had to think about too much. Um, but but it's becoming you know really something that 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 we need to be uh, focusing on a little bit more and making sure that the messages that we're sending are tailored to the audiences that that need it the most. Um, take five, I would certainly say, is probably um, the the I'd say the punchiest, um, most concise advice out there. And I do believe that they can also provide some um, some promotional, some physical promotional materials as well um, that, that may be of use, particularly to universities. Um, so that, that they'll probably be the, the resource that I would push for uh, in re respect to students. Brilliant. We can all have a look at those. Somebody else has said um, action fraud has had some bad press in recent times with delays, poor investigations, et cetera, due to lack of resources. Do you know if that's improved at all? I know you can't um, probably comment on what the bad press was, but do you know if things? Yes, yeah, so obviously, I, I I do know that we're, we're quite a prominent organisation, so we have been in the news. Um, unfortunately, I can't pass comment, and I don't actually have uh, any update on um, any of the ongoing um, work in that area. Um, what I would say is um, the, the, the system is, is, is up and running. Um, we certainly taking a look at the reports that are coming through uh, and we're, we're certainly doing our best with it. Um, so I think it will be likely that any kind of further update in that respect will be put through uh, as and when it's, it's suitable to do so in, into, the, into the news on that one. OK, thank you. Um, someone else has said uh, the mystery shopper scam is really useful because um, I think, uh, as this person said, that uh, universities often promote mystery shopping as a way to earn a bit of money, you know, because if you can do it at home. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, I've never, he I haven't heard that one before. So that was really interesting. Um, the, the rental fraud. And um, I, I also think that that is really 
commonplace. Um, and you said about searching, and, and I think um, if the line dipped out for a second, you said about searching on um, holiday letting websites. Did, did you say about searching anywhere else about where to look for the photos? So you can undertake um, relatively easily, um, quite a few search engines offer it. Um, if you save an image, uh, say for example, on a, um, a rental website and you see a property you might be interested in, you can save that image and then you can reverse search that image to see if it has appeared anywhere else online. Now it's not 100% accurate, of course, um, but what it will do is just make you know we've certainly seen instances where a reverse image search has been undertaken um and then it's it's popped up that this it was a holiday home rather than uh, a, a long-term rental flat or, or a flat for rent for the academic year so um it is something to be mindful of um that you know it, it does exist that people will rent out holiday accommodation in a different name line up some viewings and then pass that property off as their own and obviously, I mean, what, what, thinking back to when I was a student, if someone had let me into a property to show me round it, they, I wouldn't have even thought that perhaps they could have rented it. Um, but it, it, is an, it really is a possibility. So that's just a, an additional one to uh, an additional one to do just to put your mind at rest a little more. Obviously, in context, you need to be bearing in mind all of the other um, hints and tips uh, and prevention advice that, that we're giving you alongside that. OK. Thanks very much. Someone else has said they can barely hear me, so I'm very seldom quiet. Apologies if I'm quiet today. Um, someone else has said Action Broad have some nice short animations on YouTube that uh, people have used at induction, so that might be something worth looking at. And you can also maybe share them on your social media channels, so that would be helpful. Have a look at those. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, how to reverse it. Someone's put in how to reverse it an image from a mobile phone so that's really useful i know all 18 year olds can do these things but a lot of us a lot of us can't can we well it's, it's, it's yeah it's interesting that you say that Lynn, because many young people can do these things but unfortunately because of the the, the figures that we're seeing many of them are not doing these things yeah. so it might be that they have that technical capacity but they they're not thinking about um, you know, could this be, they're not fraud savvy in some respects, it hasn't entered their mind. Um, it's a fine balance between scaring them and preparing them. Um, so obviously it's been a great opportunity to speak to yourselves today um, and, and pass that message on. I know that you're essentially the front line. Um, I did have a little bit of experience in working in universities myself uh, before this life. Um, so I do know a little bit about, you know, the, the work that goes on. Uh, and, and the value that you can certainly bring to, to protecting what, what are really in, incredibly vulnerable group of people. Um, so yeah, they may very well be able to do a lot of these things, but whether they will actually think of doing it at the right time is another question. Yeah, no, that's a very valid point, but we can remind them if, if we know how to do it, we can send stuff out. And I know they're not all gonna, um, they're not all going to do it, but if we can just save a few people from being caught out, and they talk to each other. They're our best um, ambassadors, really, aren't they? Because they will talk to each other. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you've got your student unions as well. They're brilliant, um, in my experience. Um, so it, it just needs to be a co coordinated effort um, across all of us, really. It's incumbent upon all of us. Um, what I would say is that if there are any um, requests or, or specific uh, queries that, that anyone's got, um, in, uh, you know, that they want to support students or they need that help or they feel that there's something extra that we could be doing. We do have contact details on the website. Please do get in touch with us. Um, the, the reason why uh, I, I'm uh, very thankful to be invited here today, but the reason I was is because there was that initial outreach um, for me. And I'm really happy to, to, to get involved with, with scenarios like this and, and, and training sessions like this. So, as I say, if you feel that there's something missing that we should be doing, um, please send it through as an idea um, uh, and we'll consider it. Absolutely, thank you very much. Any final questions before we finish? If not, then it's my pleasure to say 
can we all say a big thank you to Alex? Oh, sorry, Lynn. Sorry. Um, I think there's one more question on the chat about um, whether overseas students are more vulnerable to such scams. Um, some countries have high firewalls, so perhaps students from these countries are less internet savvy and cyber aware. Yeah, and, and Paula said she would agree, often they're particularly vulnerable to being scammed by people from their own country or culture. And I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Alex. Yeah, hi, hi, hi General Paula, thanks for those. I'm going to attempt to put my video on because it would be nice if you see me at least once in this uh in in, in this uh in this session um overseas students um yeah they can be more vulnerable to specific scams obviously uh, each nation uh does have its own infrastructure and, and the way in which it regulates uh, and permits uh users to, to engage um online um it can also be uh due to the political climate as well um so an example of, a, of an advanced fee fraud that, that we did see. Um, they were, um, unfortunately, there was a, a lot of um, students from, from South Asia and Central Asia that were studying in the UK uh, and they were receiving um, threats that um, they'd gone over to the UK and that there was um, an illegal parcel that had, that had arrived in, in um, China and they were telling the British authorities about it. Um, if they didn't pay a fine there and then. Um, so there was that kind of exerting and threat and pressure um, because of the reputation, obviously, um, and, and that was causing some concern. So you do find that there are some um, specific uh, scams out there that, that will be um, very, very concentrated to specific communities to exert pressure, depending on um, sometimes, you know, their, their, their national background. Um, so, so, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, there are always the, the threat and risk that uh, maybe nationals um, from other countries that, that are here already will try to target them. Um, I think sometimes, you know, it's a natural human response to, um, I guess, either group up or contact people who are maybe the same as you when you do go abroad. Um, and obviously some people, that's brilliant. Universities make use of that by hiring ambassadors themselves. Um, so that they do have that friendly face and that, that familiar same experience. But bear in mind as well that there will be people out there that will try and exploit that um, for nefarious purposes. So it does work both ways, really.